We're here today, July 28th, 2014, at the downtown Concord Law Offices of Martin and Hipple with the eponymous partners, Steve Martin and Seth Hipple. First, congratulations and thank you. You too. For, for another satisfactory outcome for me, for Liberty, and of course, for your up and coming young firm. Um, what's the case resolution that we're celebrating and documenting today? Well, your case, Bill, was the last of the recording cases that we had. We had a series of them, and uh, yours settled for $35,000. Um, no indication that any of it had to be confidential, which was nice, so we can talk about it like we are now. And also, what I think is most noteworthy is that there was a letter of apology from the chief saying, we're sorry that you were arrested for recording a police officer. We shouldn't have arrested you, and we won't do this kind of thing again. So uh, this has been an arduous path, certainly from my perspective. Could you step through some of the timeline uh, for this case and prior uh, some of the uh, legal aspects and uh, put it in context uh, with related cases, of which there are at least a handful. Sure. When we started, um, I was your criminal attorney, as you remember, Bill, and when we started, Glick didn't exist. So when I filed my motion to dismiss in the criminal court, uh, we made three primary arguments. We said that, first of all, recording police is protected by the First Amendment. We said that under the New Hampshire wiretapping law, police officers uh, did not have a reasonable expectation of privacy in how they performed their duties, and therefore, recording them was not wiretapping. Um, and we also made an argument related to tele telephones and whether they, how, how they relate to, uh, to the wiretapping law, which is a little bit more inside baseball than the rest of it. The court took a long time to issue its order, about four months. Um, and in that intervening four months, the Glick decision came down. And the Glick decision said, yes, there is a First Amendment right to record. In fact, the court said, we recognize that there was a constitutional right to record back in 1999 in a case called Ayakabuchi. And therefore, it said the police officers involved in the Glick case, the Boston Police Department, had to pay damages. They didn't have qualified immunity. The court, after that ruling, issued an order saying, I'm going to dismiss the case based on the Glick decision because this is a First Amendment right. Following that, we filed the case in the Federal District Court for the District of New Hampshire, and we said there is a constitutional right, a First Amendment right, and in retaliation of the exercise of that right, the police arrested and prosecuted Bill Alleman, and therefore it's what's called retaliatory prosecution, which was the main federal claim that we were filing in the court. There were a few other claims, but that was really the heart of our case. In the meantime, we had another case, uh, the Carla Garrett case and we had survived summary judgment in that case already. Summary judgment is a process in federal court when you file a civil claim. The defendants, both sides can file, but in general the courts will only grant it for defendants, so generally defendants only file these motions for summary judgment. And the defendants said um, in the Garrett case, there's no constitutional right to record traffic stops. Um, they drew a distinction between traffic stops and other types of police activity. So they said the Glick case had to do with a case on the Boston Common, and it was out in broad daylight, whereas in the Garrett case, similar to yours, it was a traffic stop in the nighttime. So they said this is an inherently dangerous situation, and the Glick decision doesn't cover it. And then they said, and even if it does cover it, we wouldn't be, have been able to know that it covered it, so you should give us a freebie on this one. That's what qualified immunity is. It's basically your first one's free, kind of. Um, basically says that if the, if the police didn't have a way to know that what they were doing was illegal, then they don't have to pay damages for it. So at the end of the case, you win, but you don't get anything for winning. Uh, you don't get any damages. So Garrick was appealed. Uh, they went up to the First Circuit, and we argued that case. And we said that the First Amendment right to record definitely extended to motor vehicle stops. We explained why that was important. We explained how other courts had looked at it. And there weren't honestly very many, but we took what we could. And after a rather long wait, what, seven or eight months, the uh, First Circuit came down with a decision that said, of actually a very broad ruling, uh, it said that the right to record traffic stops is, there, there is no exception 
uh, a no traffic stop exception, which is what the what the state was trying to carve out, some kind of exception, some kind of narrowing rule. And uh, the court actually spent some time explaining more about the right to record and why it was important. And so I think it's it's going to be a very important a very important decision because the Third Circuit has actually touched on this issue of whether traffic stops are different than other types of recording events. They didn't actually rule on the issue. They kind of said we might consider this at a future point, but they kind of indicated mm, we're not so sure. And so this this ruling helps to squelch the negative effect of that Third Circuit decision for other circuits. So we have, as you said, there's a few cases. There's the Seventh Circuit case, there's Alvarez in the Seventh Circuit, there is Glick in the First Circuit, and then there is Garrick in the First Circuit, all three of them dealing with recording police specifically. So these three cases are going to form the foundation for everybody else that tries to sue police in every other circuit in this country. And it's going to be, I think, very helpful for them to be able to look at these, these cases and say, other courts have, have found that there is a right to do this. Courts feel a lot more comfortable with making rulings when they aren't the first ones to do it. Courts don't like to be the first on scene. And when they're usually first, they usually give very narrow rulings. The interesting thing about Garrick is it had a lot of challenging facts. It was at nighttime in a very rural area. There, was multi there were multiple vehicles. One of the uh, people, not my, not Carla, but one of the uh, people there had a, a firearm, properly licensed, but the idea was, well, judges can be scared of firearms. All of these things did not change the outcome of the case, and I think that it actually helps in the end, because now you take a case, any case, and they say, our case isn't as bad as Garrick was, and look at how good their outcome was. So the bad facts have actually become good facts for our side of it in this case. So while we're waiting for that to come down, you and I and, and Steve attended mediation. And I can't really get into the details of that because it is confidential, but the case wasn't able to settle. We weren't able to agree on a, on, on a just resolution. And at the after the Garrick decision came down, the, the police wanted to come back to the table, back to the negotiating table. Problem is, um, after the Garrick case came down, our hand had increased pretty well, you know? You start out with a I'm not saying our case was a 5-7 in poker terms, but when you start out with a 5-7, if you flip a 5-5-7, five, five, you know, you, you treat your hand a little bit differently. And uh, so the, the, the law was, was definitely helpful in where we wanted it to be. So the value of the case had increased because the chances of winning had increased. And so we wanted to have something substantial, uh, something that we took away from this case that actually mattered and would make a difference for other people that were in your situation. There are a few ways to do that. Um, one of them is to get an admission of liability or some sort of apology from the department, some kind of acknowledgement that says this was, you were in the right, we were in the wrong. As you can imagine, it's not very easy to get the police to say something like that. So that be began a lengthy negotiation process where we were very firm. We said this, we, we want some sort of acknowledgement we want the next person who comes who says, you know, I don't know if I should record this because all these people have been arrested. We want that person to have some assurance that what they're doing is, is okay. In First Amendment law, we have something called chilling. There's a chilling effect. And the courts will often say, even if this particular law or ordinance didn't stop the plaintiff from speaking, it could have stopped someone else from speaking. And the problem with the chilling effect is it's something you never see. So you never know if there's a chilling effect. It's just kind of out there. And what I wanted to do was reduce any chilling effect that the arrests, your arrests, which had been publicized and the other arrests that had been publicized, I wanted to reduce and minimize that chilling effect. So by having the police say, yes, we were wrong, you were right, we won't do this again, it allowed us to go to the, to the media and, and let them, let other people know this is something you can do. You don't have to worry about how you do it. Or you do have to worry about how you do it, but you don't have to worry about getting arrested for it. So what does it mean uh, going forward? And, uh, is, the, is the broader issue resolved? Um, as one aspect, how specific is all this to uh, police and not government employees in general. 
Well, the cases all deal with police because in general, police are the ones that more, more often than not, after being recorded, follow up with an arrest. So if you're recording a town clerk, she might call the police and the police officer might say, don't record again, which would be an unlawful order. But police officers have the direct power of arrest. So most of these cases deal with police officers. Although the cases are careful to talk about public officials. Um, and when we filed our pleadings, we were always very careful to, to talk about public officials, not police in particular, but pu public officials in general. And so this, these rulings do definitely protect anybody who's recording a public official. Yeah, I think <clears throat> I think this uh, the, these cases, the Garrick the Garrick case and, and your case to some extent deal with the police specifically because that's sort of where um, recording is taking us. It's taken us to the position where people are directly recording uh, the police and not other government officials. In our in our briefs that we filed in the Garrett case, we actually cited a line of cases that discussed uh, recording public officials generally. Uh, and of course, as Seth was saying, you know the police would be involved at that point, but the recording had to do with public officials separate and distinct from the police. Whereas these cases are now dealing specifically with the police. So now I think we're starting to cover the broader spectrum of government officials in broader terms, including including the police. So, and if you look <clears throat> at the case law, the the as it, as it progresses. The first case is Ayakabuchi in 1999. Um, that case involved, I believe it was a town clerk or a board of selectmen or something similar. So it was town officials. And it was on that case that the Glick court said that the officers in Glick didn't get qualified immunity. And then Garrick is a clarification to, or an expansion of the Glick decision. So the line of cases actually started with a public official not that wasn't a police officer. And I think that's significant. Mm -hmm. So do you perceive that there is more work to be done on this issue, particularly in New Hampshire at this point? Well, the thing about the common law system is that there's always ambiguity, and the courts leave it that way on purpose. So yes, where would that work be? The Garrett decision talks about the right to record without, basically without an undue disruption. And when can the court give a an order to leave or disperse from a scene in the Garrett case the officer had never told her to leave there was some facts that indicated he had told her to um, go across the street and to stop recording but he never actually told her to leave the scene would that be a lawful order that's the question there's a lot of case law on what when an officer can order someone to leave and when they can and to be honest they have a lot of discretion so the if you look, there's always unintended consequences to every decision. The unintended consequence of this decision is likely more orders to disperse. But if you're standing, if a person is standing from a, a reasonable distance from the, the scene and is attempting to record, I think the question then is going to become, does an order to leave violate a person's First Amendment rights? So if a person is ordered to leave, even though there's no reasonable basis for them to leave, and they're recording, and then they're arrested for, say, disorderly conduct because they don't leave an, or an area once they're ordered to. Is that a retaliatory prosecution under the First Amendment? I think that's where most of the work is going to be done. The good news is that in cases like yours, where we're talking about you're pulled over, you're on the side of the road, you're not going anywhere until this stop is done. So the officer, I suppose, could order you to leave, but that's what you want anyway. So the uh, ability to record those is pretty well established because a person can record their own interaction without having to worry about that order to leave. Indeed, it's it's evidence, one would assume. Yes. The courts don't talk about whether one needs to inform the officer or not, and it's a gray area in some ways. I, I don't think it's a gray area. Some would consider it a gray area in New Hampshire law about whether you need to inform public officials I don't think they have a reasonable expectation of privacy, so I don't think that someone needs to inform them. However, I wouldn't advise a client that they didn't have to inform them because I don't want to get sued when the person gets arrested. So I would say it's best practice to inform the person that you're recording, but if you don't, you will very possibly be okay. I can't say what 
the percentage possibility or the probability of having a conviction in that situation would be, though. Well, in where, at least now, supposedly, it's definitely being recorded from the other side, so everybody's aware already. Yes, correct. So they're wearing body cameras, from what I understand, which is the first for New Hampshire Police Department. I don't, I'm not aware of any other New Hampshire department that's wearing body cameras. And that's a great step forward. Yeah, they fought it in the legislature. Uh, Representative uh, Tammy Simmons, I believe, uh, sponsored for SWAT teams, just just for state. I think it was state police state SWAT police. teams to wear cameras, and it was laughed out of committee uh, room. Basically, you can go watch the video. I, right. <laughs> for some reason, the uh, police, a lot of police, don't want their work to be reviewed by the public, and a lot of them say, "Well, we don't want second guessing for how we do our jobs," which indicates to me that they're not completely positive that they're doing them correctly. So, the question becomes. This, and this is a this is a debate that we've been having a lot lately with the uh, the WikiLeaks issue and with the recording cases. How much of what our government does are they allowed to do in secret? And what does consent of the governed even mean if the governed can't even know what they're voting for? So are we just voting for um, you know people to be on the front cover of Time magazine and not actually know what they're doing, but they can you know cut ribbons and have Easter Bunny festivals or whatnot? Or are these people actually going to implement policy that the people have a, a way of reviewing and a way to interact in that process? And when we don't know what the police have done except what's written in a police report, which is always sanitized, it's always written from one point of view, I think it, it becomes very difficult for us to determine whether the intent of the laws are actually being carried out by the law enforcers. The fact that they are so the law enforcement community in New Hampshire in general is so frightened of being on the record indicates to me that there's a lot of concern about what's actually happening, that these uh, these officials aren't sure that they're actually following the law. Even with qualified immunity? Even with qualified immunity. And while it's true that, you know, going into a home as a, you know, in a SWAT team is a, is a very uh, intense situation and it requires a lot of split-second decision-making, if these SWAT teams are putting these officers into a position where they have to make split-second decisions that aren't going to be the right decisions, then we need to reevaluate the SWAT team usage in general. So it's not just whether an individual officer is making a mistake, it's whether the departments as a whole are overusing things like SWAT teams. I mean, we've seen an increase, a very huge increase in the amount of SWAT teams in this country for things that didn't used to be treated that way. And obviously when there's an escalation of violence, which is what a SWAT team is, it's an escalation of violence, you know, you kick down a door, you often shoot shoot family pets, things like that. When there's an escalation of violence, there usually are negative consequences. And I would like to know what they are. And I think that people deserve to know what they are. And that's not going to happen without some sort of recording and documentation. But that, that shouldn't detract from um you know, the, the people still continuing to record the police doing their duties in public, and that is because, as we've seen in the past, specifically with Ware, um, they used to have dash cams. Uh, not only were they difficult to get footage of, they were also difficult to uh, constantly maintain and ensure that they were working. What we don't want to end up with is a situation in which, sure, the, the police are walking around with cameras on their bodies, but are they actually working? Are they actually, <clears throat> excuse me, are they actually recording and can we actually get access uh, to the resulting resulting film and, and recordings? So I, I think that it's important that you know we look at this. Yes, it's a it's a great step in the right direction that the police officers are are now going to be accountable for their actions. But at the same time, we still need to be able to ensure that we record them ourselves to ensure that there is in fact a record being made of their interactions with the public. Correct, and people shouldn't rely on the police record of their of their case. I've, well in the Garrett case for instance, the, um, the video footage disappeared somehow. From the multiple cameras, cameras in vehicles and in the police uh, station. Yes, yeah, right? so and one of the one of the officers was careful to note in his report, my camera wasn't working today, you know, just, just so everyone knows this interaction where there are multiple disputes about what was actually said and done, we just so happened to not be able to figure out how to make our cameras work. So it's still important for people to make sure that they're, they're getting records of, of uh, what's happening with their interactions with police. But the First Circuit did find it relevant in the Garrett case. Actually, Judge Thompson asked 
Attorney Bauer, the attorney for the the police, you know, are you aware that a large number of police departments in this country now have body cameras or dashboard cameras and body microphones? So to say that the police have some sort of reasonable expectation of privacy, her implication was, is kind of nonsense. Mm -hmm. So with your uh, work particularly on uh, these two cases, uh, are you satisfied? Yes. I am. I think the the Garrett case is a landmark case. It is the first case in United States history from an appellate court to determine squarely determine the issue of whether recording police traffic stops is protected by the First Amendment. It is the first case such as that. And given that the majority of people's interactions with police are going to be on the side of the road, and a large percentage of those are going to be at night, I think it's a very important decision. And of course, we filed these cases to change behavior. We wanted the police to stop doing what they were doing. I had worked with various legislators to try to pass a bill that would change, clarify the wiretapping law that went nowhere, and so these cases were the next strategy to say, let's try to find a way to make these recordings, or these ar recording arrests stop. And when you get a police department to admit in writing that they did the wrong thing, I think that's a pretty good implication that it's an end of an error. So yes, I, I am very happy. I think that the difference between the time that we started these cases and now is very stark. But I think it's important to note too. Not only not only are we are we happy with the Garrick decision because again it is a landmark decision and again it it, it you know, the decision came down in much more broader terms and we we expected it to come down. But we should also look at your case uh, as being successful in the sense that we did get that letter of apology and it was much much different than your standard letter of regret. It wasn't a gee you know we regret that this happened. Um, let's all move forward. This is look you know what we did something wrong, we apologize for it. I mean, we, you know, that is, I think, much more uh, astounding, you know, than your general letter of regret, and you never see a letter of apology, you know, from these police departments, ever. It's rare. Yeah, it's very rare. Or, or, or the uh, no admission of wrongdoing clause haven't gone missing. Right. Exactly. The, in general, so that people understand, when we settle a case, 99.99% .99 of the time, we're going to have a clause in that settlement agreement that says neither side admits to doing anything wrong. This is a settlement of a disputed claim. And we, at the end of the settlement negotiations, when we sign that settlement agreement, will withdraw our case. So there is no finding for either side in, in, in a settlement normally. In this case, there was no finding for either side either. That's, you know, the, the case was concluded. But even in Garrick's case, when we settled Garrick's case, there was a no admission of wrongdoing in that uh, in that settlement and when we settled yours there was an apology and like Steve said there are times when you can if you're if you have a pretty good case and you work really hard you can sometimes get this letter of regret which is like that fake apology that kids give you know like you know I'm sorry that I hurt your feelings you know kind of thing like I didn't do anything wrong but I my mom said I had to apologize you know but this wasn't a letter of regret and we were very specific about that this is an apology this means mea culpa, I did wrong, you were right. And that's what we got. And yes, it is very significant. It doesn't happen very often at all. So any final thoughts? I don't think so. Keep recording. Exactly. <laughs> Excellent work as always, counselors. Thank you very much. Thanks, Bill. Thank you.